Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Community chest, go to jail, go directly to jail. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. If you or I were playing Monopoly, then that is a card we might have a darn it moment over. Holmes has been playing a similar game as we've seen recently gallivanting all around the country with her partner Billy Evans and their two children. And the card or cards she got dealt this week read Go to prison, go directly to prison. Do not pass freedom, pay $452 million. So, a slightly offbeat way of introducing the latest two pieces of news that befell Miss Elizabeth Holmes these past few days. Firstly, there is the outcome of her appeal. We might call this an interim appeal, not the appeal against the verdict itself, but against the presiding judge de Villa's ruling that she must stay in prison whilst the appeal itself takes place. Fairly obviously, her take is that she wants to remain free while she goes through the process of appeal, because there is compelling evidence to show the trial was essentially mishandled, and that, had it been conducted fairly, no right-minded jury would have found against her. And all this was, in case you didn't know, in respect of her being found guilty on four fraud counts, including conspiracy, against investors in the now defunct biotech company Theranos, or as I've been prompted to call it, the now defunct biotech sham that was Theranos. And the other party to the conspiracy was one Mr Ramesh Sunni Balwani, who was found guilty on 12 counts of fraud, in his case against both patients and investors. Secondly, there was the ruling on restitution which arises out of the verdict and was calculated by the presiding judge de Villa again. He handed down his ruling on this this week and that amounted to, as you heard in my preamble, $452 million. Let's look at each of these in turn and I'll try to provide a brief synopsis of the salient facts and of course what this means to Ms Holmes. Now, I've spoken about the grounds of Ms. Holmes' appeal a couple of times and once in some detail. However, there were some redacted elements to that and I provided a little bit of guesswork in respect of what might be in the redacted parts. However, I think I'll look at doing a separate video together, recapping what her appeal is and actually looking at the court documents in some detail to, to go through it and give it some justice. So, on the appeal, let's just separate appeal and appeal. So, there is the interim appeal, as I've termed it anyway, which is to remain free while she works through an appeal against the trial and the verdict itself. I was wrong at one point because I thought it would take at least six weeks, similar to Balwani, for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal to render its decision on whether Miss Holmes should stay in prison during her appeal or remain free. Not so. It took them three weeks in the end. In this appeal, both Holmes and Balwani used similar terms. Uh, The actual phrase that was used by both of them, I think, was that the errors and abuses that biased the jury were so egregious that they be allowed to stay out of prison while the appeal unfolds. And I'm afraid there really isn't much more to it than that. So Holmes will face her appeal, the main appeal that is, from the wrong side of the fence, as it were, in prison. And in case you are wondering, these dates do change. The new date for prison, as I write this, is 30th of May, which gives her about 11 days of freedom. I should point out that one thing that I've been taking for granted somewhat is that the prison that Holmes will call home for the next 11 years will be Bryan, a woman's prison in Texas. Now, in Balwani's case, we saw his prison location change twice, actually, from the original that Davila proposed. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the Federal Bureau of Prisons, who actually have the final say, assign her somewhere else as well. We wait and see. And to the restitution. Now, when the trial was completed, I looked at the amounts of the investment that the individual investors Holmes was found guilty of defrauding amounted to around about $145 million. However, the amount of restitution ordered by de Villa, $452 million, was handed down as a joint liability of both Holmes and Balwani. In other words, they are both on the hook for the whole amount. 
So 452 million, and let's give a quick recap on how this arises, or we'll look at the biggest um, elements of it anyway. The biggest of the amounts awarded was $125 million, and that was to Rupert Murdoch. You'll remember that Holmes essentially pursued him directly and essentially led him by the hand to invest in her scam. The RDV Corporation, and this is the Amway investing vehicle of which former US Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has a vested interest, will get nearly $100 million. And I say will get, let me just come back to what they might get after this. And the others, well, they include Wells Fargo CEO Richard Kovakovic, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, who will get $4.1 million. Lucas Venture Group, that of Don Lucas, will receive more than $7.5 million, and so on. And the two big retail investors, Walgreens and Safeway, had $40 million and $14.5 million, respectively, awarded in their favour. So these were the highlight numbers from the restitution itself. I've got a couple of observations on this. Um, the obvious point of difference between Balwani and Holmes restitution, which doesn't appear to be addressed uh, to me in the documents anyway, is that Balwani was convicted on 12 counts and Holmes convicted of four. Now, of Balwani's counts, four of those related to patients. So we have eight investor-related guilty verdicts in his trial, and four in homes. So you might think that the restitution amounts should be different in respect of the investors that were scammed and were found guilty by the jury in both their cases. And as another aside reminder, don't forget it wasn't that Holmes was found not guilty on the others, it was that the jury could not make up their minds. So there was a mistrial in respect of those particular verdicts. Now, what brings this all together to my mind is the fact that one of the counts that both of them were found guilty of was that of conspiracy. So, conspiracy would put its arms around, to some extent, I think, the whole enterprise, the whole scam that they were involved in, and therefore all investors that lost money were in one way or another impacted by their actions or their fraud. And that's why I believe the judge has made a ruling or calculation, maybe a better way of putting it, based on his assessment of the investor losses, but then taking into account that both of them were guilty of the conspiracy and gave the joint restitution award. And uh, two right two, in my opinion, they were in it together and should be responsible together. Okay, so Holmes cooked up the whole thing originally, but Balwani wasn't slow in coming forward and perpetuating the fraud, covering up things like the Edison's not working. You know, after all, he was in charge of the operations there. Now, it's going to make sense that in Holmes' case, she's going to argue on the restitution that, at the very least, some of the calculated amounts should be set aside. And no doubt, the Court of Appeal will address this in due course. And the point that... I'm going to come back to that I was hinting at a moment ago is it all could be really academic. Holmes can't even pay her lawyer's fees from what we know and her contribution to the joint liability is not going to amount to, well, anything at all, is it? Bawani, on the other hand, was independently wealthy before he even met Holmes and I did read a report a couple of years ago which says that he made 40 to $50 million out of his forays into the dot-com uh, bubble in the early 2000s, getting out just before the bubble burst, and that this had grown to somewhere near 100 million um, by the time this trial started. Now, whilst I have no way of verifying his wealth per se, you can see that even with a rough estimate, it's going to wipe him out when he has to make good this restitution. I would suspect, although I'm not sure, that there are garnishment orders of some type over his assets, wherever they may be at the moment, and that these will no doubt be seized in due course if he doesn't uh, volunteer them directly. Well, with such vast sums awarded against her, and the next decade and a bit of her life looking like it's going to be spent behind bars, I can only think that Holmes must be thinking, well, I've had better weeks. And I have said it before, but it really does look like we are nearing the end of this, I guess, first chapter in the trial. 
you know, if you remember, it's been a well over a year since her verdict, and she is only now just seeing the doors opening on the prison. A little bit of an appeal from me. I have been trying to find out some details of when the appeal itself will take place and what the timescales for the um, appeal are. Most of the court's particulars and uh, summaries I've read just say it, it depends or words like that. So uh, not very helpful. But if anybody has seen any court documents with dates, I'd really appreciate you leaving a note for me. I'll, I'll follow them up. And on that final appeal... Bye for now.